Okay, to preface, it's a well-known family secret that my maternal grandfather, Gramps, served in the Waffen SS during the Second World War. He was wounded in action and still has his wound badge in silver for his lost two fingers. In the 50s after the war, he moved to America. He worked in Pontiac at a General Motors engine plant for 40 years. When he retired in 2001, he was a true American. He owned a nice house in the suburbs that he gave to my mother as a wedding gift. He owns a big property up north where he hunts and fishes, and he drives a beautiful old 66 Corvette. He passed away last week from acute lung cancer at the ripe old age of 97. He never smoked a day in his life, but they say a lot of veterans breathe in a lot of bad stuff during their service, so I guess it wasn't too surprising. I was always pretty close to Gramps, so I got a little bit of a surprise in as well. He left his daughter and only child almost everything that he owned. However, his oldest grandson, me, got the key to a safety deposit box that no one knew anything about. An old man with a limp whom I had never met before introduced himself at the funeral after the service and the will reading. Our conversation went something like this. You must be Lewis's grandson, David, am I correct? Well, yes, who might you be? My name is Jonas. I knew your grandfather for quite a long time. He had said with a smile. He looked to be maybe 60, and he had a thick accent. I couldn't place it, but it might have been German. Well, it's nice to meet you, Jonas. What was it that you wanted to speak to me about? His entire demeanor changed from one of kindness to a simple, cold determination. I'll be blunt. I know what you're going to find in that safety deposit box, and I don't think you want to be wrapped up in it. He reached into a pocket and withdrew a thick envelope. I believe this is more than enough fair compensation. Five thousand and all I want is that key. What it seemed like a genuine concern from the older man at first had rapidly turned into something sinister. His offer had seemed more than a little forceful, and despite his strangely small stature, I found myself more than a little intimidated. I'm sorry, but my grandfather wanted me to have whatever's in that box. Five thousand just isn't worth disrespecting my grandfather's final wishes. His expression darkened considerably then. I'm afraid you're making a mistake, son. A grave mistake. And with that, he had turned and left the building. The whole event had seemed almost like a movie scene more than real life. I knew my next step was to investigate the safety deposit box. Maybe Jonas had been a friend's son from back in Germany. Or maybe he had been some kind of guy trying to get my grandfather's gold or something. I didn't know the whole story at the time anyways. The bank let me in with no issues and when I entered the vault, I discovered the key opened a tiny little box numbered S32. As I opened the box, a hiss escaped from the apparently sealed container. The rush of air smelled like old paper and a hint of rust. Inside the box was an original copy of the Mein Kampf. I'm not sure what I expected, but it certainly wasn't this. As I lifted the book out, I found it to be in excellent condition, no worse than a paperback at the public library. I flipped the cover open and found a small note written in what I assumed to be German on the back of a little photograph. It was extremely faded, but it depicted a man in a black uniform leaning up against what looked like a small artillery cannon. Maybe Gramps, but it's hard to tell. I stood scrutinizing the photo for long enough that the security guard at the door eventually asked if I was alright. That snapped me back into reality. I turned to leave and as I was walking past the guard and out the door, I heard a little clatter. I turned around to see the guard picking up the safety deposit box key. I checked my pocket and found my key was still there. So the guard offered me the key. This fell out of your book, he said flatly. I took the key and read the tag. 
S33. On a whim, I walked back to the wall of small deposit boxes and I opened up S33. Another rush of air, another faint scent of old paper and metal. Inside this box, however, I found a small leather-wrapped journal and a little cardboard sleeve with what looked at first glance to be a booklet inside. As I inspected the journal, I felt a hand grab my shoulder firmly and I spun around. Sir, your 15 minutes are up. It's the next guest's turn in the vault. You can take anything or leave anything that will fit in the boxes, but we will need you to move along now. After briefly catching my breath, I tucked the books into my satchel bag and locked the two boxes, and then I walked out after the guard. I did my best to translate the little note when I got home. It turns out that it wasn't written in German at all, but rather Finnish. The note read, Louis, SS Pazenjager Battalion 6, Nord, and redacted, Winter 1942. I flipped through the entirety of the book, and there were a lot of writing in the margins. I'll probably translate that for you all later if anything proves interesting. In the back, I did find a small slip of paper. It had some sort of rune shape on it. It looked like three lines crossing each other like a snowflake. I wasn't sure what it meant, but it somehow felt sinister. Though that might have been the terrible book I was holding. The small cardboard sheath held a tiny booklet. On the front, the little booklet said, Sold Booch, with a pair of SS runes above the word. Inside was a picture of my grandfather, along with the identification information, like his name and blood type. The last book, the leather-bound journal, was what drew my attention enough to translate first. I couldn't read the German, but after translating, it seemed to start out innocuous enough. The book started out with leaving home. Apparently, he wasn't tall enough to serve in the army, so he joined the SS instead. His unit was sent with the army to invade Norway, and he almost killed a British soldier there. According to his journal, his shot missed only because he was shivering from the cold. But I would like to think that maybe he didn't want to really kill anyone. After Norway, his unit was sent up to Finland, where his unit of tank hunters were tasked with stopping Soviet tank attacks across the river. That summer in 1941, was supposedly a beautiful time to be in Norway. Above the Arctic Circle, it never truly got warm, but the forests and the fjords were described as beautiful. Operation Barbarossa, the German invasion of Russia, was more or less just a slow walk for him. The anti-tank guns were slow to move and he didn't see much fighting at all. When the fall rains came, and the guns couldn't be moved thanks to the mud, his unit was put up in a defensive line in the forest around the Russian town of Zapolowarny. Daily life in his unit consisted of lots of sitting around in the growing cold, cleaning and re-cleaning the anti-tank guns, and patrolling the forest around the river that they were stationed by. When it gets interesting is in November of 1941. Now I can't read the German to translate it myself, but I'll try to make the Google Translate as readable as possible, while keeping it as faithful to the original as I can. November 3rd, 1941. Freezing today. The wind was broken by the trees, but we can hear it overhead. Our sentries brought in a group of Finns escorted by some Finnish ski troops. They were just normal people. They said they lived in a village that was destroyed deep in the forest. The people described a fierce attack in the night by the Soviets. What these ski troops described sounded like an artillery strike, but we have no records of such a strike. It trickled down through the ranks that there might be such Soviet self-propelled guns in the area, so they decided to send us, the tank hunters, to investigate. Lieutenant Zimmerman decided to send four gun crews in numbers of four through seven, plus the Finnish ski troops to act as translators and maybe do some scouting for us. There's not much of a dawn anymore, as the sun doesn't rise as much in the sky, just somewhat lightens, but we leave in the morning. 
November 4th, 1941. Bitterly cold again. Moving barely keeps you warm. Exposed skin turns red and then white in only minutes. And then it loses feeling. The horses are bundled as tightly as we are. But I fear they don't have long. Something about the forest just scares the horses. The Finnish troops say that there are wolves around. They spotted tracks and found a carcass of a caribou. I've known horses my whole life, and the wolves of Silesia never scared horses so badly. And because I've always liked studying language, I've spent some time with the Finns to try to learn. As we sat around a fire talking, I noticed one of these smaller men looked particularly young. I asked the Finns commander, only to find that the man in question was in fact a boy of 13. His entire family had been killed during the Winter War of 1939 to 1940. He had been hunting in this very forest at the time. The unit commander had only accepted the boy after he had stalked the ski troop over 100 kilometers through the treacherous forest and heard the boy's story. He wouldn't allow the boy to see combat after all. He was just a child. But the boy was allowed to follow along and hunt with the man. I tried to speak to the boy before I left, but he wouldn't even acknowledge that I was there. Strange folk, the Finns. November 7th, 1941. It was bitterly cold again this morning. The sentries seemed to have shirked their duty as they are nowhere to be seen. We camped in two places to avoid an artillery strike destroying all four guns, but there was no smoke coming from the other camp, which is strange. After investigating, we found the other camp, a mess. Men hacked apart in their tents, with the various parts simply missing without a trace. The tents themselves were slashed and burned. We never heard as so much as a shout, let alone a gunshot. The guns numbers of 4 and 5 were untouched, but their horses were in the same shape as the men. Lieutenant Zimmerman was found, or more correctly, what was left of the lieutenant. Most of his legs were gone, as though they had been torn off by something with teeth. Perhaps the strangest part, though, was that in one hand he held his bayonet, and in the other a scrap of fabric. Not Soviet uniform, but rather the rough spun fabric of the Finnish ski troops' cloaks. A quick inspection found that none of our seven Finns were missing part of their cloak, so they were all cleared but resentment was quick to form. I may be the only one to notice, but the boy of 13 was nowhere to be found. It's worth noting that a few pages were torn out here, and unfortunately, it looks like those entries are lost forever. November 10th, 1941. At least Command was right. We found these Soviet self-propelled guns, but they were just like our own camp. The men were hacked apart and their tents burned. The vehicles were in perfect working order though, just some snow on top of them. The whole site looked to be maybe three days old. Plausible enough that it might have been attacked around the same time as our past campsite was. Though it must have been a different group of Finns, if indeed it was Finns that did it. We got two of the four things running. We all have dozens of gallons of petrol on board so we think we can drive them around a hundred kilometers assuming no breakdowns. It'll be nice not to have to walk for a while. The second lieutenant decided to put me in charge of one of these Soviet tractors. We hitched up our gun at number six and got my crew on board. We can only fit three inside the warm casemate, a driver, a gun loader, and a commander. So three will have to ride on the outside at least for now. The Finns flatly refused to ride and decided to ski alongside. The boy still hasn't returned and I'm starting to worry about it. The Finnish commander simply wouldn't acknowledge that the boy was ever there, though some of the other troopers would give me sideways glances when I asked. This entire situation seems very strange, more so even than the brutal attacks. November 11th, 1941 the boy returned this morning. He was just there, sitting around the Finnish campfire. No one else seemed to notice that there was anything strange about his presence, nor did they notice the terror in his cloak. 
and we found the village today. Another group of torn apart Soviets. This group was small and their gear was ragged. Maybe they were survivors of the other group. Maybe they were deserters. I really don't know. What I noticed though was that one of them had a knife in their cold, dead hand. They also had another scrap of cloak fabric. I hid this from the others. I don't really know why. Maybe I just wanted to keep my own fear from spreading. Or maybe I knew deep down that there was nothing we could do about it. I caught the boy looking at me from time to time. November 12th, 1941. The other house burned down in the night. The remains of the men are just bones and ash. Even still, we could see these spots where their bones were scarred, as though by axes or another blade. They must have been ripped apart in their sleep. With these second lieutenant dead, I am in charge now. We need to get the heck out of these woods. November 13th, 1941. The paranoia is getting to everyone, and Schmidt broke. He just started waving his rifle at anyone who came near. He refused to get back on board the tractor, and when he started shooting at us, we had no choice. He took four bullets before he went down. I can only pray that my shot was not the one that stopped his heart. We had to press on. It's getting even colder at night, and the sun doesn't rise, of course, but even the faint light we see... It tells us that the day is gradually getting dimmer. Schmidt was the most veteran among us. He always said that winter in the mountains is the worst thing in the world. I guess he didn't want to spend winter in this place. It's darker again too. The fire barely seems to illuminate beyond itself. Where once the fire threw warmth and light in a five meter ring, it now barely illuminates the man opposite of you. There were 28 of us and 7 fins plus the boy. Now, there are only 6 and 3 fins. The boy is gone again. November 14th, 1941. Only one of the fins returned today. The three went to scout ahead of the vehicle, but only one came back. He was mauled badly. His right arm was gone and he had a deep cut in his chest. As the only one who could speak any Finnish... I tried to translate, but it was almost unintelligible. Our medic wasn't able to save him. In a fit of pain and suffering, all he said was, Please, please, Jonas, no. We're being watched now, I'm sure of it. Why he didn't stop at us at the outset of this cursed journey, I might never understand. All I can hope is that he believes the rest of the division will be too much for him to defeat. We will be making our way west as quickly as possible. I don't think we can outrun him. There were more pages torn out here. November 17th, 1941. The banging doesn't end. I don't think he understands that the vehicle is armored, but he won't stop banging. We've had to drive so slowly due to the closed trees that we're barely making walking speed. All of the hatches are shut and the tractor reeks of three days of crap. But if we open anything to clear the air, he might get in. The banging won't stop. It just won't. Always the banging. November 19th, 1941. We're out of fuel. There's no hope now. The vision splits see nothing but trees all around. We can get the extra fuel off the back of the tractor, and we can move the vehicle without fuel. I think we might have to fight it. November 20th, 1941. It got them. My hand is still bleeding as I write, but the nurse might take my journal from me, so I must write it now. We tried to fight. I don't know what other choice we had. We had rifles, but the boy had claws and teeth. We riddled it with bullets and bayonets, and I even managed to lob a grenade at it. And I think I managed to hurt its leg because... It limped into the woods and didn't follow me right away. I paid for that with two fingers off my hand. No one else escaped. I can still feel its eyes watching me. The one who made it away. And the banging, I can still hear it. I can still hear the banging. I jumped and sheepishly grinned. 
someone was simply knocking at the door. Unnerving as it is, my grandfather must have written this silly thing to pass the time. There is simply no way a little peasant boy from Finland could have killed 30 men, much less have traced my lineage to find me. What an absurd notion.